Good morning, DEF CON. Welcome to track one. This morning's first talk will be by Agent X. It, it is a look inside security at the New York Times. Hi, I'm Jesse Krems, and today we'll be taking a look inside security at the New York Times. This talk is also unofficially titled A Media Security Primer for Hackers, but it's really for both journalists and hackers. Most talks start off or end with a thank you at the end. Everybody rushes off stage thanking all their friends. But really, I'd like to start this talk off by saying thank you to a bunch of people. First of all, my girlfriend for her love and support and for, um, you know, putting up with all my craziness when I'm like, hey, honey, I need you to get out of the apartment while I record my talk because I don't want anyone to see me doing it because that would be weird. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone at the New York Times who's uh, reviewed this talk with me and helped me make improvements and helped me dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make sure everything looks really nice and sharp. We really do try to get this story right every time. Um, it's been a crazy couple of years uh, and in that time we've all gotten to watch a lot of movies and get to watch the Fred Rogers movie. It was really great. And there's a scene in that movie where they take a couple of moments just to think about all the people in their lives who have helped them get to the stage in life where they are right now. And we don't do that enough. So let's just take a few moments right now to just sit quietly and think about all the people that helped us get to where we are in our lives today. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to do this in person? Phone it in. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, I'm Agent X. I'm a longtime goon here at DEF CON and uh, I'm going to be talking about information security at the New York Times and I'm going to start off by talking about some of my privileges and my biases that got me where I am and help you give you some color on this. So 22 years ago I started doing DEF CON and that really kind of primed me for working in uh, media security because uh, DEF CON is basically a crazy event with things changing every day and it's super chaotic and crazy and just over the top. And uh, I really like it. I like it a lot. It's been coming a long time. And I started doing, I started a nonprofit called the Hacker Foundation. That was the first time I dealt with the media as both a subject, as a subject and then supporting them. And then I had a bunch of regular jobs like a normal person. I did like, I was a bike messenger, I was a caterer, I was a webmaster for a brewery, which by the way, it's a great job. Don't ever give it up. Don't do that. Um, and I was working for the phone company and that was great. And then uh, a couple years ago, I decided to go to the Internet Freedom Festival in Valencia, Spain, which is a wonderful event with, it's basically like, uh, journalists and activists and people from all over the world come and they're talking about digital rights and security needs and they have these little tiny beers there. They're little one euro beers. They're really great. And I was having one with a reporter and they, they were asking me about how to talk to a source. And I was like, oh, I, I can handle this. I work for the phone company. The source sounds great. And they're, they say, I want to talk to the source. I said, oh, you should just ring them up on signal. And he goes, oh, the reporter doesn't have a cell phone. And I was like, oh, okay, well, or the source doesn't have a cell phone. I was like, okay. Um, just call them on their landline. You can do a couple things to minimize your footprint with them. And he goes, no, 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 you don't understand. They have a phone like this. And I'm like, they have a crank up phone. So this is the importance of knowing the context you're operating in. Turns out the source was a farmer in a village on a party line. And they were talking about some things the government didn't like. So I didn't have a solution then, I didn't have a solution now, but it really got me thinking about some of these really interesting and unique challenges that were out there. And I, I, I went away from that conference and I said, you know, maybe, maybe I should go work in media security. So a few years go by, um, I'm spending a lot of time in New York, there's somebody very special out there, hey baby. And, uh, the, um, and I see an opening at the Times. And uh, I put in my resume, I file all my paperwork, and I knew someone who worked at the Times who was at DEF CON. Networking helps. Um, 
And I said, could you pull my resume out? I'm kind of a non, uh, an, I have a non-traditional background. It's not going to keyword find. I'm not going to get in there. And they pull it out and I do the rounds of interviews, do the phone screen, do the three phone interviews, do a full day of team interviews, right? It's like fight club of interviews. And they liked me, they really liked me, and uh, I've been there at the Times ever since. So that's kind of the quick story about how I got hit to the Times. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really, I felt a lot of the stuff from my background has really helped me there. Um, but that's not really the end of the journey, because uh, you, you need a daily why, right? You need, a, you need a reason to be there, get up in the morning, be motivated, right? Um, and one of the things I think is really important is being an engaged citizen in our country. If you want, you know, uh, the fourth estate is an important part of uh, a democratic country. Having an active and engaged media and citizenry and curious readers is really key. Um, and I get to do that every day, right? I'm challenged with that problem every day. Uh, one of the things I really love about our job is that it's not about protecting shareholder value. This is, ugh, you know, uh, we, we, you know, it's really about a mission. Uh, we are a publicly traded company, but that doesn't, you know, that's like not the biggest issue. Uh, and we have really hard problems that are complicated and new and you can have really whiz bang solutions for technical sides of the problem, but if you can't explain them over the phone to somebody and have them be able to implement them quickly, and understand how to work them, it doesn't matter, right? So that's always a fun side of the game. Uh, and the people at the Times are really interesting. There's a lot of characters there. If you've ever seen the movie Whiskey Tango Foxtrot with Tina Fey, yeah? Anyone else like news people movies? Yeah. Um, that woman works at the Times. And like my first week there, they're like, we're meeting with that woman who's played by Tina Fey. And I was like, yes, yes. So that's, that's cool. And the work is evergreen, like every day is a new challenge. I think um, journalists and hackers have a lot of crossover in a lot of ways, and it's right there in the middle of the Venn diagram. We like the information to be free, we just kind of do it a little differently. Hackers like to go out, get some cool, find something neat and be like, buddy, look what I got, this is awesome. Journalists like to be like, buddy, look at what this hacker showed me, let me show the world. Um, which is really convenient because I hate doing PR. Um, uh, and I think journalists are good. They're also, you know, there's a bit more rigor in the kind of like anal uh, news analytics that journalists do than hackers do. So like that's, a, that's an important uh, distinction between the two of us. So I'm going to go over the times by the numbers really quick because uh, it, help, it kind of gives some perspective. Um, this is also kind of a media talk, uh, but no news org is the same. But I think we're not that different. Uh, but we're really old. I only like working for old companies. Before this, I worked for the phone company. You know, technical debt. Yes. Um, and we do have a lot of technical debt at the Times. And we have a lot of traditions, though. And we have a lot of history. Um, I work at the headquarters at 620, the Glass Castle. Um, and below that building, uh, in a big underground basement is the physical paper archive and facilities of the New York Times. We don't really need them as much anymore, but we also don't want to lose that stuff. So I got to go down there a couple, before, in the before times, I got to go down there and paw through the paper card catalog, like remember when you, if you're old, you know, like at the library, and pull out uh, original press photos of my great-great cousin or great-great uncle, Felix Krems, big-time Broadway actor. So that was cool. Those are the original photos. That's some fun stuff. Um, and that, that, I think that's important. I think that protecting the legacy is as important as building a future. Uh, we have 4,500 employees. Uh, so we have 1,700 print, uh, reporters. 200 of them are overseas. The overseas reporters are really the tip of the pen. They um, they're the first on the ground. They work very independently in very dangerous environments. And so getting them properly secured and trained up in non-permissive environments is really, really fun. Um, 
we have a huge newsroom in the States. We're doing basically the same work for a lot of those folks. And then we have data flows and so on. And then we also have like, you know, people who run printing facilities and we have 500 plus developers with all the information security concerns you might have about developers, of which there are many. Um, we have 31 foreign bureaus, 16 national bureaus, and offices and facilities scattered all over the world. Um, besides doing the process of newsmaking, we also run printing presses. So we, and they're huge, they're giant printing facilities. They're the factories that make papers. So we have the same security concerns that any manufacturer would have. Um, we own forests, so we have paper. There's a whole new security thing I didn't know I was going to have to think about in my life. GIS security. Uh, we have 7.8 million subscribers. That's a lot of PII we have to protect. Um, we have 100 plus million registered users. That's an entirely different data set, but you can imagine um, some of the uh, ways that that might be used. Um, and if you think about the old classical infosec training of CIA, uh, not that CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, um, you know, we have a huge audience we need to serve globally, uh, 76 million people. Um, and we push a lot of news pieces every day, 151, 150 plus news pieces all the time. So that's not just news articles, that's not just what's in the paper there, that's podcasts with Michael Bobaro. And, uh, and, you know, TV shows, all kind. you know, we have news crews now, we have video production, we have drones. Um, so getting all that data working. And then finally, there's a plus sign after everything on this slide for a reason. We're growing. I used to work in a dying industry. That had a bunch of challenges. Growth has a ton of challenges, right? I mean, you have to think what's good now, but what's good in the future too, because we're going to have to scale this. So we're doing that um, all the time. And it's nice to grow up being in a growing industry. Uh, news making is not a growing industry in general, but at the times it is. Um, this is not an I show, it's a we show. There's actually a giant InfoSec team. I'm just one part of it. Some of that people are in the audience right now. Uh, so we have a security operations team, which I work on. So we are the frontline question and answer crew. Um, for any questions that people have and need help with immediately, we kind of fill in in a general way. Um, we have an intelligence operation which does both forward and backward intelligence collection and helps us know what threats to focus on and be aware of. Uh, we have an education team. I think that uh, this is vastly overlooked in a lot of InfoSec programs, but we have four people who handle education at the times just for information security. Uh, and getting programs out there and doing in-person trainings and doing in-person consultations, so thank you. Um, we write the New York Times app. No, you know, no other company does that, so it's key that we have a great AppSec team. Um, we have a massive cloud architecture, so we have a secure architecture team for managing that and monitoring and doing visibility controls and all the cloud security you'd need. No one would have a job if there was no incidents, and incidents are terrifying experiences for people that don't deal with them on a regular basis. So we have an incident response uh, coordinator who helps us uh, kind of keep everyone in line and managed. Um, and then, you know, we're in New York City and we're a global company, so continuity is kind of important. I mean, I can't, there's been a lot of continuity events in New York City alone in my lifetime. There'll be more. Uh, so that's it. And then, you know, we're a giant company, so we have risk and compliance. And that's just InfoSec, right? It's just the InfoSec team, as we call it. Then we have both national and international physical security teams we work with. Um, they're an amazing crew of people dealing with a variety of threats and threat landscapes around the world and in the United States. Um, this is increasingly uh, dangerous and interesting work. Uh, and all three of those teams co-coordinate all the time as part of what we call the threat response team, which is basically where we just all get together and go, oh boy. Um, and then we have really wonderful systems administrators at the time, so I cannot thank these people enough for doing a really great job at their job and just, you know, holding the line 
Uh, I think if you still have to nag people about patching systems, that sucks. We don't, and that's great. Uh, and we have an end user support team that is top notch and very good at keying us into like the little, little triggers that they're like, oh, you need to talk to security right now. <laughs> Um, and then we have editors, support staff, and journalists all over who give us street tips. They're like, oh, so this source told me this. And I'm like, thank you. Um, it's really great to have like a whole tech team that just covers Silicon Valley and gets us cool info. Um, and also they ask us great questions and, you know, they're, they're, they're partners in the process. And then, you know, we have a lot of people that used to work at the Times and they are, the, the past is, the present is built by the past and having um, a really uh, deep bench of people who used to work at the Times is great and they've really helped to color and build the foundation we operate on now. So that's another one. Oop. So let's talk about uh, journalist security for hackers or if you're a journalist in this room, I hear there are four journalists at the the times that are here to this year. So maybe one of them is in this room. Um, <laughs> uh, this, so this is for everybody, basically. This is the big old, really hard to read chart on threats to journalists. And on one side, we have murder and death. And on the other side, we have law warfare and civil litigation. Um, 66 journalists lost their lives reporting in 2020. This is, this is, I mean, three weeks ago, two journalists were killed in a week, right? It's not, we, we are really dealing with serious, uh, serious situations in a lot of cases. Um, and too often, repressive governments um, are, are willing to kill journalists to keep their citizens in the dark about their actions. Um, and we often, and you didn't, and, you know, when I, when I started doing InfoSec, it wasn't like, oh, I wonder if we're protecting people from being targeted for killing. Eh, how much we've grown. Um, I'm going to talk about harassment in a bit, but um, uh, harassment is a huge issue and it definitely helps to, it definitely influences our speakers. Um, but one of the things that uh, harassment uh, uh, leads to is self-censorship and self-censorship is the death of journalism. I don't protect journalism, I protect journalists, and they protect journalism. We give them the bubble to operate safely and securely to do the best work they can to get the story out for curious and engaged readers. Um, and part of that is protecting them from hacking, uh, Political pressure is definitely something on the spectrum. We don't deal with it in InfoSec because that's way above my pay grade, but um, that is definitely another concern. Denying access, that's the denial of uh, press credentials or access by people that control access to newsmakers or basically just PNG, persona non grata someone out of a country. Uh, has happened at my job, which is, I think, both horrible and a badge of honor. Um, that we've had we've had reporters deport deported out of the, out of uh, countries as well. Um, another way that uh, journalism is threatened is through ad pressure, uh, ad boycotts. That definitely affects some news organizations uh, more than others. Um, then censorship. We are somewhere right now at this very instant. Somebody is trying to censor the New York Times. We run a censorship busting operation. We operate our own uh, Tor Onion service version of the New York Times online. You can totally read the New York Times there. Please do. Um, the, our friends at Tor help us a lot on that and it's much appreciated. Um, reputational attacks are attacks against uh, journalism as a practice, organizations like the Times, uh, the idea that we should even have newspapers and news outlets and also rep uh, um, reporters themselves, just attacking the reporter uh, as an illegitimate or biased source uh, of news. And then finally at the very end of the spectrum here we have the, the idea that there are civil people making civil arguments in civil rooms um, and winning them through nice conversations. And that doesn't always occur. We call that law warfare. 
Um, and that's the quick threats to journalism uh, matrix that we, or graph that we work on. Uh, journalists have a, basically three basic security concerns. There's the physical security, which is increasingly a concern in both the United States, where it's a very, we like to think of it as a safe place, and, um, and elsewhere. Uh, and then information security, it ties in, it's crossed because now that we have, we've seen uh, uh, activities where people's cybersecurity is compromised as a lead up to a physical attack. So that's a, that's a concern. Um, and then this last one is kind of meta, but um, psychosocial sec uh, security for journalists. We're increasingly recognizing that a lot of the lifestyle choices and uh, long-term kind of ways that journalists make it in the newsroom isn't necessarily the best thing for living a long, healthy, productive life. Uh, and so there's been some changes around that and that will continue to evolve. That same thing's actually happening in our community. Uh, but we're really trying to work away from training journalists uh, for sprints. We're trying to train them to be ultra marathoners and live long, happy lives and take care of them really well. Uh, old journalists are awesomely fun to hang out with because they have the best stories and they've seen a lot of awesome stuff. So the stuff in highlights is the kind of stuff that we worry about on a more regular basis here. Uh, so quickly talking about harassment, um, Lucy at the CPJ um, helped me put these numbers together. 63% uh, of all journalists have been harassed online within the last year when they did this study in 2019. That's, I mean, I think everyone in the hacker community knows that harassment happens online, but basically you are guaranteed to get harassed both individually, like individual people harassing you, and systematically if you're a journalist doing newsworthy news. Um, uh, 58 have been harassed in person. I mean, that's a pretty big number. That's like somebody com coming up in your grill. And then for a job that, as I imagine it, is like taking notes and typing, 26% um, of all journalists have been attacked physically. They're not wrestlers. These people aren't trained in, you know, combatives, but they're still being attacked. Um, and I think that that really is uh, something to, to really let sink in. Oops. Wrong slide. Um, also, if you are a female journalist, these numbers are even worse. So nearly two-thirds two of women in an International Women in Media Foundation's um, study say they have been threatened or harassed at least once, so the numbers are even higher for them, and uh, one in ten of their respondents has received a direct death threat, um, which is a mark above harassment. So it's, it's even worse for uh, female journalists, and there are more and more women working in journalism, so it's a it's very serious issue. Um, and harassment goes hand in hand with social, uh, social media presence. Um, having a large social media presence is a huge boon for journalists, right? We tend to follow newsmakers who we ha feel authentic and, you know, we can connect with through their social media forums, our posts, right? But at the same point, it makes you a huge target. Um, curating and maintaining this presence is work. I don't have much of one because I'm lazy but a lot of our journalists have very, very active and very real social media presence on a variety of platforms. Um, there will be serious programmatic, both uh, state actor and non-state actor run harassment campaigns against these people. Um, most platforms are woefully unprepared to provide any real support to these people at all. Um, it is shocking how bad it is. Uh, once you get behind the curtain a little, you're like, where are, what are you doing? Um, uh, and, that, and it's even worse if you're just a regular human being, right? I mean, if, if you've ever been harassed as a non-public persona, you have almost no support from social media platforms. Um, hot takes by journalists that are, they could be, <laughs> they could be the most, would be like, that's barely a hot take, um, are the ones that get the worst hits. Uh, so my tips to all journalists out there is be very thoughtful and considerate about everything you are posting um, and very crafty about it. 
we often get a question about where uh, journalist security responsibility ends. Um, who's responsible for the security of a journalist, right? Uh, and is it the editor, is it the security team, is it the masthead of the paper? And really, it's the journalist, because there are so many competing interests inside the, um, inside the newsroom and for journalists to go after stories in a variety of places that, um, and, and manners and ways that they really have to be well-informed and be able to, uh, um, you know, uh, say, this is too dangerous for me to cover. I need either more coverage or support or help with this um, because it is, it is really, they're, they're the only ones that are collecting all the data and it's really their life on the line. Uh, I'm going to quickly digress from my recorded notes and say there's a really good example of this, which is back in the day it was very common in conflict areas over long periods of time in, to cycle journalists into conflict areas to cycle the long-term journalists out for a vacation, right? So you'd be a long-term journalist in a conflict area and um, they'd cycle out somebody and they'd send some, they'd send some young reporter in to cover them. And a couple of years ago, one of this, this young reporter said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know, this conflict zone for three weeks. I have no training and I have no idea what I'm going to do there. This is the first time in the history of journalism ever that that happened. Um, and that was a sign about how common it was for uh, newspapers and uh, news orgs to send people who were woefully unprepared into conflict areas and journalists to basically bow to the pressure of that event because it is good for their career. We are working to change that. Uh, and it is through training and advisement. <laughs> so we're big on training. We do a lot of really cool training at the Times. We provide a lot of circulars. We talk about a lot of stuff. Training is what we do proactively uh, to get people prepared. And then advisement is what we do custom for them for specific stories or events. Um, you have to make sure that it's tailored to their needs. Um, and journalists are really great because they're very curious and persistent. So any advice you give them, you really need to make sure that it's actionable. It's not theoretical at all. It's the do this, right? Practice. The, um, that's really one of the key sort of things for them. It's they, they don't, and they'll, they'll ask why, but you should know why because you wrote the paper and made the guidance. So here are five basic practices for all journalists. Um, and if you are interested in uh, helping a, a media organization and they're like, journalists are like, what should we be doing? Should we be like, you know, worrying about this or that? Start with these five things because they're super easy from an infosec standpoint and they're the basics. Um, so strong, diverse passwords. Use a password manager, right? The, um, any password manager will do. It's fine. Any like online password manager, totally great. But journalists get a lot of creds all over the place and they tend to do the thing so that make us as InfoSec practitioners terrified. They're like, oh, I came up with this really good scheme I can remember. And I'm like, no. No. Um, so going hand in hand with that, go to second factor authentication on all the things, all the times. Uh, skip, just skip over SMS because we're already seeing um, SIM hijacking used against journalists in a targeted way. So they're trying to defeat their 2FA through SIM hijacking attacks. Uh, so use authenticator apps, uh, use hardware tokens. Um, if you're ever going to deliver hardware tokens to journalists, deliver them two hardware tokens, one to use and one to back up, and then have them put the backup codes in their key vault because shit's going to go sideways. I promised myself I wasn't going to swear during this talk. Uh, VPNs should be collected like cookies just all over the place. Um, companies should provide a... in. Uh, VPN into their systems, of course, but also they should be collecting third-party VPNs. Any of the nameable, reviewable, reputable VPN services are just fine. Uh, and uh, they, there are a variety of solutions out there. Uh, so 
just VPNs. And it's very funny. People ask, the journalists ask me, when should I use a VPN? I'm like, when you're not at home and when you're not at the office. And they're like, should I use it at DEF CON? And I'm like, yes. Yes, you should. Or should I use it at the Olympic press pool? Yes. Yes, you should. What about the UN? Yes. Yes, you should. It's very simple stuff. Um, assets. So one of the things that happens is uh, we all tend to like just run on one laptop. It's really important for journalists to compartmentalize their personal lives and their professional lives because um, generally speaking, when they get targeted, they're going after the professional works and it really sucks when it compromises their personal lives. So having two phones, having a work phone, having a, per a personal phone, having a work laptop, it's really hard. For, um, for freelancers, that's a little trickier because it's not like they don't hand out laptops like candy. Uh, so, but if you can do that, you should totally do that and make sure that that's a regular practice. Um, just, you know, it, it's really key. Uh, please update early and update often. I don't know anyone that's suffered from updating. I do know people that have suffered greatly from never updating. <laughs> I think we all have. I love those exploits from five years ago that work. Why would I update? Everything's working. No. Use secure messaging platforms whenever possible. Use Signal. Use Signal. Please use Signal. Uh, there are third part there are other messaging platforms and that is where sources will be you should you can you should use them you need to talk to sources over more secure platforms but um, if you can move to signal that would be great uh, we are big supporters of using signal at the times you might have heard that use signal so if you're an editor <laughs> Uh, you're also part of this whole problem, and you're also part of the solution. Uh, editors like to hire really smart journalists. You need to communicate. If you're an editor, you need to communicate your security risks that you know about to the journalist. Even if the journalist is a seasoned veteran, make sure that they know stuff that you may have heard of because they may didn't get the memo. They may not know about it. They may have managed to survive for years, like just not knowing that danger was flying around them. Uh, if, they're a, if they're a junior reporter, they need to know this too. Um, and also you need to listen to your journalists' security concerns and take them seriously. Uh, they are not to be discounted. Uh, and then you need to connect those reporters with resources, both the physical security resources that they will need, the infosec resources we provide, and the cycle so social support networks that now exist because it is very, very important that we get these people in a proper pipeline. You need to have a regular and, a regular and clear cadence of communication with um, your journalists. And we teach this in our training and I'm going to teach this to all you right now because this is also a good takeaway. PSI, position, situation, and intent. Journalists in the field, where are they? Like, not relative, absolutely. Also, where are they relatively in the story, right? Are they coming to a conclusion on this thing? Are they still wandering around in the woods? So what's, the, what's their position? What's their situation? How what is their personal situation, uh, their safety and security situation, but also what is the situation on the ground around them? Is the crowd getting angry? Good to know. Um, and then what is their next move? Where are they going? What do they think they're going to go do next, right? Um, when stuff goes sideways in the field, these are the three factors, that, the three things we're going to start looking for right away. And it basically is the same kind of stuff we do in InfoSec, right? We want to know, you know, what's the current state? What's their, you know, where are they? What's the current state? And then what do they think they're going to do? So please, please get your PSI in order. And then finally, you have to do all the five things that you know were in the previous slides because having, you have to be the example, right? You need to provide, um, you need to say, yeah, let's talk, let's talk over signal, right? Let's communicate this way, let's do these things. Yeah, here's my UB keys, I use a key vault. Uh, because you've obviously made it from journalist to editor and 
And a lot, for a lot of journalists, that is their career goal. So they're going to follow your example. So that's the quick, quick how to consult for journalists and news orgs. Um, but this is the other stuff that we deal with, which is really kind of fun. Um, gathering and secure handling of source materials is a hoot. I, I love it when um, the journalist comes to me and they're like, so I got a source and they've got like 20 gigs of data. And I'm like, yes, awesome. It's on an onion share on tour. And I'm like, this will take a while. <laughs> Um, and we also run into legal concerns. Um, we like sources to, if, you, if you're a source out there and you're listening, um, there's a lot of things we cannot help you with. We will not direct you what we should look for. We will not direct you how to acquire something. You need to decide what you think is important that the world needs to know about as a whistleblower or a source and give it to us. Uh, hopefully through a secure means that we provide to you. Um, there's re legal reasons for that, and they are, that's why we have lawyers, but that's a key thing. We run the tips line, and we help assist run the tips line at the times, so you can, if Johnny can encrypt, he can send us a secure GPGP GP message, or you could use secure drop, and it's a lot easier. I uh, would we'll gladly take your files that way. We also develop custom uh, drop methods for sources in complicated situations. Uh, we're always on the lookout for what nation state actors are doing, what they're interested in, what they're targeting, what they're working on, uh, what their capabilities are, because they often will use those capabilities um, against journalists and sources, so we kind of need to know what's going on. Uh, this also goes for non-state actors as well, but um, it's a little harder to pin down some of those non-state actors because of suddenly somebody's like, oh, now I'm going to go after that news org. Um, I'm a telecommunications guy, so I spend a lot of time uh, thinking about ways that telecommunications, the internet, can be used both as a surveillance tool and as a uh, um, uh, way to get information or be observed. So working that, that magic is kind of always a thing we're interested in. Um, we're also, we do a lot of research work about how we can get data in and out of areas that you usually can't get data in and out of because of rules and facilities. So that's fun. Um, massive LTE backpacks with like eight SIM cards in them so you can live stream from wherever. Uh, we are... In, often dealing with industrial control systems, which is kind of totally different from all the stuff in the rest of the slide deck. But like I said, we have a um, printing facility and it has everything that a modern factory would have. So we have to deal with all that stuff. Um, AppSec, I mean, the application security thing is a big deal. Uh, there's tons of exploits and issues we have to deal with. We have our own bug bounty program we manage and deal with through that. Uh, cloud architecture, of course, because we have a giant cloud presence. We run on multiple carrier, multiple providers and multiple carriers, uh, and you need to automate and consisticize across all of them with all of your controls and management techniques. And then the gray business of the gray lady, right? We just, we're an enterprise company, so we have all that stuff that enterprise companies have, like the, you know, the mainframe we don't want to talk about. Uh, and that's, I, you know, I make a joke, it's the gray business of the gray lady. But it's, um, it's important work, right? It's how the checks are written, it's how my paycheck is written, so that's cool. Uh, and it's the HR systems and all that kind of stuff. So there's all that going on too. So it's not just all sexy journalism all the time. Uh, so this is my list of hard problems, and if you're looking to get into this, you will find uh, plenty of work to be done here. Um, social media platforms generally, uh, oh, I gotta go faster. Okay, so social media platforms generally don't put their, um, their security controls in a consistent language and then they change it every time, right? So it's like, hey, this is how, you, this is how we suggest you lock down your Facebook account, for example, or your Twitter account, and then 
somebody will come back to us and be like, I cannot find that. And we're like, that's because we wrote it yesterday and they changed it last night and now it doesn't work. Um, so if anybody has any control over the presentation of, uh, con of security controls and privacy controls on social media platforms, it would be great if you would maybe come up with a scheme where you could pull the data from a file, you know, and I could be like, this is the policy I would like you to employ. Um, I just want the most hard thing to get in the entire world. If you could build me like a box about this big, it's battery powered, it gets me like multiple, like hundreds of megs of data transfer in both directions anywhere in the world uh, that's dead simple to use and works in every environment, that would be great. Um, you know, it's not a small ask. It's just, you know, I just, you know, if you're in Mongolia, I need 100 meg in the sky in downtown New York too. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to get over the days of like having reporters like call us on a sat phone and dictate the story to somebody, uh, which has happened recently because uh, bandwidth is not spread evenly over the entire globe. Uh, and that's kind of the macro level deep field issue. There's also the uh, issue of, and you'll notice this here at, at, at DEF CON, right? We, we pile a bunch of hackers in here and then suddenly the cell network just falls over and we can't, com we have no comms. Um, so what happens at like large conventions or rallies is that journalists go in, they do the story, but then they basically have to leave the event to get to some facility to put their, to post their story. Um, so having something where you could basically have a wireless mesh network like Gotenna that could push print ready photos and video would be really cool. This is also not a non-trivial ask, but it is awesome if you could figure out how to do that. Um, most mobile device management is super heavy. It's like, hey, this is the company phone and we're going to do what we want. Uh, we work with a lot of freelancers. That's not how it works in, this, in the world of journalism. So a lightweight opt-in MDM where basically the end user can set some policy and then we can lock it down and if X happens, we can do, we, the people who are not being detained, can, you know, wipe your phone for you or find you um, would be cool. Um, we do a lot of remote journalist check-ins. So a journalist goes to an interview and the interview is going sideways and they kind of know it might go sideways. So we do a check-in with them. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I got arrested. I'm having a meeting without T now. Uh, those don't work at scale though. So we really need a scale tool that does that. So you can do that to multiple journalists at the same time uh, and not have to, and you can keep them all straight and know what's going on. Tor network speeds, I kind of touched on this. When you do get that 20 gig drop, it is totally um, awful. Uh, there's, it's, so Tor is making a mighty effort to speed up the, the Tor network. We would love it if you would contribute by building proper relays and exit nodes. Helping them, sending them money would be good too. They're all wonderful people. Uh, source media sanitization, we get a lot of random stuff from a lot of people. Um, some of it's malware. That's not cool. So if you could, we're looking for better source media sanitization tools that aren't designed for like very rigid pipelines of production like you'd see in a financial industry. Uh, better tools for searching and analysis of just random file piles of data. Here's 20 gigs of stuff. It's photos of printouts. It's PDFs. It's text files and CSVs. That's a lot of data to go through and it's kind of hard to parse and in the news cycle we're trying to get stuff out faster. So um, basically mixed, large mixed file sets, file analysis and intelligence aggregation gathering would be awesome. And finally, uh, we, so in the tip system we have Signal, we have WhatsApp. People mount campaigns to tell us about horrible things that are happening in the world that they think are newsworthy. And, they, and our message volume goes up by 10x. And suddenly, all the, we're getting the same tip over and over and over again. And we need a way to, and the, the WhatsApp signal, all those clients don't really have a way to filter that stuff. Um, and this happens to every news org. So we really need a, 
uh, client that we can run on our end that allows us to um, you know, manage that stuff. And finally, um, Bellingcat has a whole OSINT list of GitHub projects that they're working on that has the same, they have like a bunch of cool stuff, like how to find uh, where this photo was taken on Instagram. So if you want to get involved, I highly suggest uh, attending the Internet Freedom Festival or similar meetups that will be happening in the States and possibly next year in Spain. Uh, if you're looking for work, the Digital Rights Job Board is up there. We have, I post all the New York Times recs up there. And you will also find um, uh, a bunch of other orgs out there that work in similar places. There are other news organizations besides the New York Times. I know it's shocking. They're not very good. But it's true. Uh, there's Gannett, which is also USA Today. Uh, the WAPO, that paper down there in Washington. The Wall Street Journal, us, Bloomberg, CNN. The BBC has a huge security operation, by the way. Reuters. The AP, which I didn't, I didn't, I worked in news, and I didn't know they, how the AP worked. There's like a bajillion of them, and they have a bunch of security people. And finally, your local alt weekly and your local news orgs are really, really um, in need of your help. So just rocking up to them and being like, do you have enough time to let me try and help you if you could use some help? Might be helpful. And then if you are a researcher or you kind of want to get into the meta space of this, there's a bunch of really or great organizations out there. There's CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists. There's Reporters Sans Frontier. There's the International Federation of Journalists. There's the International Women's Media Foundation and Freedom of the Press Foundation. They write SecureDrop and a bunch of other awesome tools. Uh, and so they are all other places you can go and find some awesome, awesome work. And it's way better than protecting shareholder value. And that is the end of the show. We usually do Q&A at this time, but I'm sure he's going to give me the fist in like three minutes ago. Yeah. Ooh. Um, so if you have any questions, I'll be over there. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming out at 10 in the morning, by the way. I was totally like, no one's going to show up for this talk. Thank you. <laughs>